Many say they rule because they are the strongest, defending their claim with a very sharp sword and many angry soldiers by their side. Others may claim they rule because they are the wisest and may show their work as a proof of competence or their wealth as a proof of their good administrative skills. But if there is one claim that has been repeated over and over and over throughout history, being put on coins as early as people had the idea of writing their names on coins was, I rule because our good gods up above want me to rule. And this is what we're going to be exploring today. How did rulers of antiquity use divine imagery to support their own claims for power? And how did these claims made, made their way into coinage? Let's go! Nowadays, when we look at a modern coin, even if we're looking at a piece from a monarchy like in any pound sterling coin, our secular 20th century way of seeing the world is only able to see a coin for what it is, a store of value and a show of sovereignty of a state over a territory. Those fancy Latin inscriptions, Elisabeth Secunda, Dei Gratia Regina, Fidei Defensor, sound more like a relic and a tradition from an old English institution than anything else. But this secular world has been around for just a couple hundred years, standing over the shoulders of centuries of human societies where the divine had a very strong influence on the daily back and forth of politics, and the claim of divine right carried a very, very heavy weight to it. Connecting oneself to divinity was, in ancient times, pretty daring endeavor. In a much more religious society, it could be a very strong way of acquiring legitimacy, but if not backed by some very serious power, whether military or economical, it was also a very quick way to disgrace. Therefore, it's not surprising to see that the more autocratic a government is and the more concentrated power is on a single individual, the more they have the tendency to connect themselves to the divine forces as a means to justify their authoritarian heavy hand on their subjects. Although it was not the first case of a deified person on a coin, the many Greek kingdoms that formed on the once great empire of Alexander the Great quickly used their bigger-than-life image of Alexander, as well as the old gods of the Greeks, to reinforce the imagery of their own divine right. One of the very first portraits actually intended to depict a real person on a coin were the posthumous tetradrachma issued by Lysimachus, Alexander's bodyguard. He decided to capitalize on the episode where Alexander, when visiting an oracle in Egypt, was told he had a direct connection to the Egyptian god Amon. So for our first coin, struck at the city of Byzantion in Thrace between 305 and 281 BC, we can see him with a pair of horns, a sign of his now mixed nature, half human, half divinity. On the reverse, we see the seated figure of Athena, a very common sight since some of the earliest Greek coins. She wasn't pick picked by chance, obviously. The untimely death of Alexander sent shockwaves of uncertainty over his territories, with Athena being chosen as a reassuring image that would bring calm and order. And who would keep that calm? Well, the legends give us the answer. Basileus Lysimacho of King Lysimachus. What was once just a vague use of the imagery of a dead monarch to attract an aura of authority quickly escalated into the blatant use of the living king in divine fashion. The Seleucids, heirs of Alexander who took the eastern part of his territories, realized the only way of achieving recognition by the locals was to incorporate a series of ideas from the old eastern god emperors into their own monarchical Greek institutions. The worship of the sun and the association of the old Achaemenid Empire to the solar deity was incorporated to the traditional Greek pantheon, resulting on many coins depicting the Seleucid kings as basically living gods. This example, a humble bronze coin, struck around 144 and 142 BC, shows the very young king Antiochus VI, at that time only a kid, as a young 
but already fully grown deified man. We see on the obverse his bust with sun rays coming from his head, as to indicate his divine nature. He was given the nickname Dionysus, or the new god Dionysus incarnate on earth. Once we go to the reverse, we see a cantaros, a container used to store liquids. From his nickname Dionysus, it's easy to guess this would probably be filled with wine. Quite a significant bit of writing is also present in such a small coin. The legends of King Antiochus, the esteemed Dionysus, claims he came with the divine mission of bringing, once again, the things that Dionysus brought. Happiness, joy, to the Seleucid Empire that was going through some tough times. Unfortunately, that young kid was nothing but a puppet and not a new incarnation of a god, and he would be quickly disposed of after just two years of rulership. By the reasonably quick decline of the Seleucids, it looks like the eastern sun god wasn't really in favor of them. From their decline, the great power of the Parthians arose. Once a tribe of nomadic horsemen, their powerful war machine aligned with the willingness to accept the local culture and incorporate it to its own, allowed the Parthian Empire to endure for some 400 years, much longer than their Seleucid predecessors. The original Parthian peoples first came into contact with coinage with the Greeks, and quickly adopted the drachma standard from the territories they conquered, but gave it their own little unique style which slowly transitioned from the realistic depiction of Hellenistic coins they first found into more stylized coins. Some argue that the success of the Parthians came from a change in style of governance in comparison to the Seleucids. Instead of a highly centralized government that kept a tight grip on its governors and satraps, the Parthians adopted a feudal system where even if all subjects still paid homage to the great Parthian king almost like a god, in practical, earthly matters. High degrees of authority were given to local authorities to be more efficient, and this kind of hands-off approach, I would say, is shown on the coins, and we'll see in a moment. So for our Parthian coin, we see no divine sun rays coming from the monarch's hat. No. On this drachma, struck between 78 and 120 AD, under the reign of Pakoros, we see just a very dignified side portrait of the king, sporting a very impressive beard and elaborate clothes. The reverse seems to have picked on the Seleucid tradition of adding lots of text to the coins. We see this really interesting central image of an archer inspecting his bow, an allusion to the traditional way of making war of the Parthians, and the square inscriptions around the device translating into King of Kings, the Benefactor, the Just, the illustrious and the friend of the Greeks. Overall, a surprisingly secular coin from a region so accustomed to godlike figures of power. As we move forward in time and get to the second century AD, we get to the main political stage of the time, the Roman Empire. The Romans always had a very interesting and complicated relation between religiosity and authority. Being ruled by a republic for so many centuries meant that the connection between individuals and divinities became a deeply rooted taboo in Roman society. With Augustus, the first emperor, however, a new personality cult was implemented in parallel to the old Greco-Roman pantheon and Latin traditions. This new imperial myth basically said that an emperor depended entirely upon the blessings of Jupiter Optimus Maximus, the king of all gods, to maintain good rulership over such a vast territory. An emperor's piety, expressed through the Roman virtue of religio, was essential to pay proper homage to the gods, true rulers of all. And as a result, a good rule, victory in war, and overall success from the empire slowly started meaning that this was sort of like an official approval from Jupiter to this ruler. This close connection between emperor and gods gave rise to the deification of the best emperors. If you had a good rule, after death, your memory would be honored with the declaration that, 
From that moment onwards, the very gods raised you as one of them, and you could be venerated as a divus or a diva for an empress. The divus or the diva were a position considered like a minor deity under the true gods called Deus or Dea. This idea of a mortal raised to the divine as a result of their good deeds and special connection with the gods might very well have played some role in the development of the mythology around the Catholic saints. Antoninus Pius was one of such emperors. Ruling between 138 and 161 AD, Antoninus oversaw an empire in its longest ever period of peace and left the state coffers absolutely filled to the brim with an impressive surplus. Overall, he reigned over some incredibly good times. Reigning over such an impressive golden age meant he was duly deified after his death, with a huge issue of denarii just like this one celebrating his prosperous reign. On the obverse, we see the serene bust of Antoninus, without the laurel wreath, as he was no longer burdened with the imperial duties, and the legends proclaiming his new status, Divus Antoninus. And on the reverse, we see the eagle, the symbol of Jupiter, perched over Antoninus' funerary urn, almost as if the god himself was paying respects for such a good emperor. The legends, consecratio, consecrate, consecrated, officialized him as a new eternal figure. But while emperors got their prized immortality only after they had departed this world, some very unique characters to ever wear the imperial purple decided that they were already something divine on themselves, even when leaving. The son of Emperor Marcus Aurelius, Commodus, had a particularly strong obsession with Hercules, considering himself an incarnation of the legendary hero. According to testimonies, Commodus would wear a lion headdress, such as the one from the stories of the Nemean lion, and even participated on gladiatorial matches, which made him immensely popular with the common folk. His little lunacy, however, did not impress the imperial court. The man was so sure of his divinity that he even struck coins celebrating his connection to the hero. On his last year of rule, between 191 and 192 AD, he struck a series of denarii inspired on the old drachmas of Alexander the Great, switching the Greek hero for himself. So, on the obverse of this very unique piece, we see the bust of Commodus wearing the skin of the Nemean lion, one of the most curious designs on the Roman imperial coins, throwing out of the window any of the previous serious and very traditional busts used on these coins. This coin is just outlandish. The legends are very typical though, spelling his imperial title. Lucius Aelius Aurelius Commodus Augustus Pius Felix. When we go to the reverse, we find the weapons used by the Greek hero. On the left and the right, the bow and the quiver, full of arrows. And at the center, the club, Hercules used to stun the lion before skinning it. The legends proudly proclaim to the, Roma, to the people of Rome they have a, a hero as their emperor, Hercule Romano Augustus, the Roman Hercules, your emperor, Commodus. He might have been a bad emperor, but the man really knew how to put up a show. As we move into the Middle Ages, the increasing influence of the main Abrahamic religions changes the way monarchs use the divine as a power tool. Now, God becomes something up there, really unreachable. Gods might interfere and act upon the mortals, but no more can kings or emperors by their own means transcend into divinity by their own acts or good rulership. In fact, to give oneself the smallest hint of divinity becomes something incredibly heretical. And it's just normal that this change in the mindset reflects itself on coinage. From now on, the power to rule becomes a gift, a mission given from the divine sphere upon a chosen mortal, the king. A very special mortal, but a mortal nonetheless. The Byzantines very commonly depicted scenes of angels and saints bestowing upon the emperor the mission to rule. 
So let's analyze an example. Let's take a look at this coin struck under Isaac II between 1185 and 1195 at Constantinople. Byzantine coins have this gorgeous characteristic of being of the same style as the famous Byzantine mosaics, almost like miniature pieces of religious art. So on the obverse of this coin, we can find the Theotokos, or She Who Gave Light to God, one of the classical Eastern depictions of Holy Mary enthroned, holding the infant Christ on her lap. On Christian iconography, particularly so on coins, any saint or divine figure imbued with divine powers was differentiated from mere mortals by the presence of a halo around their heads, distinguishing themselves as something out of this world. The halo is quite a transversal symbol in multiple religions to symbolize someone connected to divinity, from the Egyptian sun god, to Apollo, to Sol Invictus, all the way to Hindu and Buddhist art, there are always depictions of some sort of halo around special individuals. And since we're talking about the Byzantines, direct descendants of the Romans, it is worth speculating if this symbol isn't an evolution of the old depiction of Sol Invictus, one of the first monotheistic religions to obtain significant acceptance on the empire. But hey, don't let anyone in 12th century Constantinople hear you saying that, they might not take it very nicely. The reverse illustrates quite nicely the point I previously made about power now being solely in the hands of the divine and not on the monarch. This is a coronation scene. To the right, we have another holy figure with the halo. This is the Archangel Michael, one of the most militaristic of all figures in Christian mythology. This was a time of great turmoil in the region. In fact, the infamous Fourth Crusade and the sack of Constantinople were only a decade away from the time this coin was minted. Bloodshed would expect it to happen, in very large quantities, so this is a propaganda piece used to justify that military action was sanctioned by God himself and was to be expected. So back to the details on the coin here. Michael is wearing full military armor while crowning and blessing Isaac. Isaac, on the other hand, holds the labarum, a military standard that represents his divine right to rule and to lead armies, and the akakia, a rolled piece of very expensive purple cloth with ashes inside, used to symbolize that even someone as distinguished as the emperor was nothing but that, ash, a mortal being. The legends translate to Isaac, the despot. As we move into the late Middle Ages, we start seeing the very first signs of the Renaissance coming up. Curiously, money itself will retain a very conservative iconography. The cross, the king accompanied by a saint, traditional imagery in general, will keep being featured commonly on coins. As much as art and culture started focusing more on man and the human experience. And the best way to show this di disconnection is to look at a coin from the very center of the Renaissance, the Republic of Venice. This silver coin, called a Grosso, was the staple of the Venetian monetary standard. Struck between 1329 and 1339, this design was reused on each succeeding doge, an elected hereditary position that led the Republic. This particular example was struck under Francesco Dandolo, the 52nd Venetian Doge. On the obverse, we see a design that would not be out of place on a Byzantine coin from some 400 years earlier. We see the very traditional seated bust of Christ, holding the Book of Gospels with the typical halo around his head. The, the only ins inscriptions we can read are the abbreviation of Jesus Christ, Ixus Christus. When going to the reverse, we find the image of the Doge and Saint Mark, the patron of Venice, both holding a flag with a cross. Right next to the Doge, we see the word Dux, Latin for Duke, and the legends Francesco Dandulo, S. M. Veneti, explaining what you are looking at, Francesco and Saint Mark of Venice. So now you know where the old phrase, in God we trust, you find an American coins come from. Sovereign powers have always tried to validate themselves through the divine. As we've seen, 
either through direct deification and allusions to godhood to more indirect ways, such as considering their rule as an official mission sanctioned by a higher being. Assembling a collection of coins depicting some of history's most important rulers is another very interesting collection you can put together. Going from the earlier coins struck by the Persians in the 6th century BC and their sun god, all the way to the modern day. And in case you want to assemble a collection just as diverse as this one, and who knows, maybe add some of these very same coins to your collection, our sponsors at Savoca Coins will be having these and over 2,000 other coins up for sale at their 106th Blue Auction on the 26th and 27th of June 2021. Their Blue Auctions feature all kinds of coins, from Greek to Roman, medieval and even modern, and are a great opportunity to expand your collection in a more affordable way. So if you are interested, definitely check them out. And if you are watching this video after the auction date, don't worry, just head over to savoca-coins.com and have a look, as another auction should definitely be happening soon. Well, now I want to hear from you collectors. Have you got a favorite deity or leader featured on a coin? Tell us more about how the people on your coins connected themselves to the gods. And if you enjoyed this video, please consider leaving a like and subscribing. This really helps the channel. So I hope you all stay safe, happy collecting, and see you soon.